On screen now, there's a thought-provoking quote. It's from D.A. Carson. Um, it says this, The gospel itself is angular. It always has been. It always challenges every generation. It challenges different generations in different ways. So in the Gospel of Matthew, we find one such challenge to our generation, and that is the issue of gender-fluid ideology. And the challenge comes from Jesus when he says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Now these words, once probably considered to be some of the least uh, controversial statements of Jesus in this generation, are actually countercultural. And just by saying them, it has the potential to create a firestorm. I read a comment just recently on social media, and it said this, Everyone is queer, and the people who aren't are evil. Now, many would dismiss that as hyperbole um, or exaggeration. I love saying hyperbole because it's such a cute name, a <laughs> cute word. Um, but our younger generation, particularly our children, are being led to believe that everyone is on a queer spectrum. This is the message being preached from educators, from politicians, from hospitals, the media. And it takes courage to bear the criticism that comes if we stand for truth, no matter how lovingly we speak that truth. Gender clinics in major Australian hospitals are assisting children as young as four to transition gender. And they are providing hormone blockers to children as young as 10, followed by cross-sex hormones. These children, for one reason or another, are experiencing a conflict within themselves, believing that they are born in the wrong body. It's a psychological condition, but it has become a highly politicised cause in today's culture wars. Now, it may be difficult to understand um, how a child of four would struggle in this way until we just consider the extent to which they are being led and even encouraged to consider this path. YouTube, Tumblr, Instagram and the like. They all promote gender swapping to our children as exciting. But even more diabolical than that, schools are teaching our students from kindergarten on that they can choose whatever gender they would like to be. In 2018, your state of South Australia was the first to allow a 10-year-old to begin puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones at 14, the same child. The South Australian Education Department procedures include the following statements. A person's gender identity or gender expression is not always exclusively male or female and may or may not correspond to their sex. The person may identify as neither male nor female or as both. All staff are responsible for ensuring positive representation of gender diversity, intersex and sexual diversity across all areas of the curriculum. Your education department recommends the use of the Shine SA resources, which gives a guide to teachers on how to affirm or transition a student who is wanting to identify as a, dif a different gender. They state this, they say, consideration should be given as to whether it is appropriate to involve the student's parent or guardian in the decision. But if parents or guardians are not supportive of the student's desire to transition, then it may be that the school can work with the child in regards to transitioning without parental consent. Shine SA also provide workshops for your teachers. And so it's not surprising that your education department has followed their advice in regards to students wanting to change gender. Again, from your um, South Australian Education Department website, regarding students wishing to transgender, it says this, ensure a student-led process. If a student does not have family or care support for the process, a decision to proceed should be made based on the school's duty of care for the student's well-being and their level of maturity to make decisions about their needs. It may be possible to consider a student a mature minor and able to make decisions without parental consent. Perhaps even more startling is the statement, in a preschool school or care setting, in a preschool where one or both parents, carers or guardians do not support or oppose the child or young person's decision to transition 
or if, or if they oppose it or affirm their identity, staff must assess what is in the best interests of the child. We're talking preschool children or young person to ensure their physical and psychological safety and well-being. Goes on to say, gender diverse and intersex children and young people should have the choice of accessing toilet and change room facilities that match their gender identity. There will also be need to consideration of sleeping arrangements should an excursion or camp include an overnight stay. The ideal situation will be for a child or young person to access sleeping quarters that correspond to their gender identity if they choose. The same considerations apply for use of toilet, shower or change room facilities for sporting purposes. That's from your South Australian Education Department. But of course, this is not just a South Australian issue. It's in every state and territory. And so it was a relief for many of us when we saw that our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, tweeted, we do not need gender whisperers in our schools. Let kids be kids. That was his tweet. That was just um, in 2000, September 2018. But his comment, that comment was labelled hateful, and the media portrayed him for, a, for many days afterwards as cruel and unfeeling. He's not alone in being targeted in that way. In 2019, there was a major online news headline that read, Candidates slammed over terrifying trans kids' comments. Now, when I read that, I'm terrified about what we're saying, that kids should be able to trans, and so I was interested in what it was saying. But the so-called terrifying comments were made by a political candidate who merely said that gender dysphoric children should be allowed to, and I'm quoting, develop naturally, and when they go through puberty, these issues will resolve. So that statement was labelled by a mainstream newspaper as terrifying. These um, reactions labelling justified concern for children as hateful and terrifying should take our minds back to the first chapter of Romans where it says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They exchanged the truth about God. When we talk about the truth about God, we are talking about who he is, but also what he said. And then the relevant warning in Isaiah that Helen's already referred to, woe to them that call evil good and good evil. Perhaps the most glaring example of calling evil good is the celebration of drag culture, which is fast, can I say, very fast becoming mainstream in our country. In regards to drag queen story times in council libraries, the Australian Labor Senator Louise Pratt said this, drag queen story time is a wonderful idea that celebrates diversity and I know that children and families will really enjoy this family friendly celebration of LGBTI culture. So with role models such as these, and with the takeover of our school curriculums, it should not surprise us to hear that our nation is experiencing unprecedented growth in referrals to transgender clinics. Between 2003 and 2007, Melbourne's Royal Children's Hospital Gender Clinic saw three children. Between 2003 and 2007, three children. By the end of 2018, that number had grown to over 1,000 children. There's been an increase of 330% in the number of children referred to Queensland's publicly funded transgender clinic over the past five years. And in the last decade, gender patient referrals to Adelaide's Women's and Children's Hospital have increased by close to 200%. Women's and Children's Hospital child and adolescent psychiatrist Dr Georgie Swift was quoted just recently by saying, the bulk of cases and new referrals are children aged 10 to 17 who may require puberty blockers. But what is not mentioned in these reports is that a major recent study of dysphoric children who were administered puberty blockers found that 100% of them, having received puberty blockers, went on to request cross-sex hormones. In fact, the research goes further and it shows that as soon as a child embarks on that very first stage of social transition, and that is choosing a name of the opposite sex, um, using opposite pronouns, dressing and clothing opposite to their natal sex, it is most probable that that child will complete the process. They will start puberty blockers and then cross-sex hormones. And I'm saying to you today, as a mother and a grandmother, that this is a betrayal of the highest order 
The denial of biological sex and the promotion of subjective gender identity is not harmless. It is a lifelong procedure that is accompanied by significant disability in the form of so many things, osteoporosis, an elevated risk of incontinence, thrombosis, cardiovascular risks, stroke, and the list goes on and on. Um, Professor John Whitehall from Western Sydney University, he also tells us that the puberty blockers have serious impact on a child's brain development and function. But the drugs will almost certainly lead to a medical pathway that will leave them sterile. Ten-year-old children are making decisions about procedures that can irrevocably alter their bodies and sterilise them. How can we expect a ten-year-old to understand the gravity of ruling out ever having children? It's more than likely that a ten-year-old has not even experienced their first kiss. How can we expect this child, for whom sex is actually still an unimaginable, probably rather revolting adult business, consent to a treatment which will alter their ability to ever experience the deep connection and love that God intended for a married couple to enjoy? Is this really informed consent? And I say to you, no, it's not. How can a 10-year-old child give informed consent? Can a 15-year-old girl fully comprehend that the decision she is making to remove her healthy breasts because she wants to look like a boy will mean she will never be able to breastfeed a baby? The extent of teenage girls having chest reconstruction surgery in Australia is now hidden from us since 2018 because our family court decided it will no longer intervene if young girls want to have a mastectomy to identify as a male. This is all despite the fact that we know, without a doubt, that the majority, in fact, almost all of children with gender dysphoria will grow out of that confusion by young adulthood. And they grow out of that by actually going through puberty, the very thing that is blocked. Confused children need our love. They need to hear our truth. They need to hear truth, God's truth. They need support. And we should carefully watch for them. We should carefully watch them. But they do not need drugs to stop them naturally progressing through puberty. Empirical fact is being denied or ignored in favour of social accommodation. And it is child abuse. <coughs> and the result is an epidemic of girls and boys confused, anxious, regretful, even suicidal as they come to realise the full extent of what they have done and what has been done to them. There is a number of groups online at the moment now um, that are, and you won't be able to read the small print here, but I'm, hopefully you'll be able to read the titles, and I'm going to read just a few, because there's a group, um, this group is on Reddit, uh, and they are groups of people who are detransitioning. De um, they're online chat groups. This one group that I'm going to um, read just a few things from you has close to 10,000 members on it just in a chat room group, and they're all young people who are wanting to detransition. Listen to some of their heartbreaking cries. I transitioned young. 15 was my first and only appointment with a gender therapist, and then I started testosterone at 16. I got top surgery, that's a mastectomy, at 17. But ever since, I've had the feeling in the back of my head that maybe it's not right. Even when I first said to my mum that I'm a boy, it didn't feel quite right. My sister would always get on me for copying her, so as I got older, I'd try my very best to not copy her at all in the slightest fashion. She's very feminine, and I was always the tomboy. Another young person. How do you stop feeling ugly? I hate the scars on my chest, and the stubble on my face is capable of growing and other areas of my body. I pluck my face several times a day. I hate having to try to lower my voice. I feel disgusting. Another person, is anyone ever happy? I feel regret and hate for what has happened to my body, features, everything, and I feel like transition ruined my body and I have to live with this sad fact. I live my days without being able to recognise the person in the mirror. Another person, I am 18. I look like a male. Since I started hormones when I was 15, I have a deep voice. Going outside is much scarier. My lack of breast is incredibly embarrassing, very lost in all this and having no idea how to deal with this feeling of loss. 
Another person, I came out as trans when I was 12 and started hormone treatment at 14. I feel like I'll never pass as female again. I grow a lot of body hair and facial hair. I feel like death is easier than having to detransition. I will forever pay for the biggest mistake of my life. I was 17 when I started transitioning. I lost half my teens and the beginning of my young adult life to an illusion made by illness. I went through years of testosterone treatment and three surgeries. This left me with big scars and numbness on my chest, but worse, it left me sterile. And the last one I'm going to read is help. I need opinions. I was on testosterone for a year. I'm three weeks off. Do you think I can look feminine again? I'm so scared. I'm only 15. I want to live the rest of my life happy and confident. I realised that what made me transition was the fear of men because of being sexually assaulted when I was 8 and 11. So as more and more of these stories emerge, the cruel and dangerous outcomes of global transgender policies are becoming clear. And fortunately and gratefully, global opposition is rising. There's a good example of this from Sweden, where a recent report from their Board of Health and Welfare confirmed that they have had a 1,500% increase in transgenderism between 2008 and 2018. That's in children who have been diagnosed as having gender dysphoria. And the age group that they were looking at is between 13 to 17 year olds, and they were only looking at girls. 1,500%, 13 to 17-year-old girls. Despite this, our state governments continue to promote and encourage transgenderism to our children. It actually blows my mind. I, I, I'm speechless sometimes. Um, but it's why it's so important that you're here today. And it's why it's so important that you support the work that ACL is doing. And I'm being pro quite parochial in this, but I, I really believe that we are working hard in this space on your behalf and we are being effective. Uh, just before Christmas, the Queensland Government introduced a conversion therapy ban bill that would have made it illegal in Queensland. We were hoping to lead the way in this. It would have made it illegal for any counsellor or medical practitioner to treat a child with gender dysphoria in any way other than assisting them in the desire to transition. The only treatment to give a child for gender dysphoria in Queensland was going to be to help them transition. So we spearheaded a major pushback on it and we had a significant win uh, that will not only benefit Queensland but actually every other state and territory as well. But we could not have done it without our supporters. We could not have done it without supporters like you. Our government brought this bill in at the end of November, about three weeks before Christmas. They they were, the submissions were closing on the 6th of February. And so we just had to get people motivated over the Christmas period and we had over 1,100 people put in a submission to our state government over Christmas. We contacted, um, we worked with other organisations and individuals and it has been really encouraging to see more and more medical practitioners actually speaking out against the practice of transitioning gender dysphoric children. And so we've seen headlines such as this in our Queensland papers. Um, the, the Law Society was agreeing that gay conversion therapy laws have the potential to harm gender dysphoric children. So we're seeing, at the, on the one hand, we're seeing this, and on the other hand, we're seeing our governments, in particular our education departments, just push ahead with their agenda. Increasingly, we are seeing high-profile sports people speaking out about the implications of gender fluid ideology in sport. Of course they are. And you know what? You're not seeing any women lining up to compete in the boys' um, team. It's the boys lining up to compete in the girls' team, and they're winning. Virtually all elite sports have been segregated into male and fem female competitions, and that's for obvious reasons. The male body is optimised for physical performance. The female body is built to be able to bear children. Not all women do bear children, but our bodies are created to allow for that possibility. But ignoring this, sporting groups from our kids' weekend fixtures right up to the Olympics now allow men who identify as women to compete against women. And when they do, they win. 
The madness was clearly exposed last year, and I've got some clips up there on the screen at the moment, in the Pacific Games in Samoa, when the winner of the women's 87 kilo division in weightlifting was a male weightlifting medalist. He was a medalist in male weightlifting. He competed in the women's division, and guess what? He won, and he won by seven kilos. So it wasn't even just a, a like, he was just like a you know, runaway winner. With the upcoming Olympics, we're talking about the coronavirus and whether that's going to damage the Olympics. Well, that's all very well and fine, but it's now been revealed, and you just Google it and you see it all there in our news, that there will be a record number, they're reporting, of transgender athletes competing in this year's Olympics. And, you know, our Olympians are too scared of the political correct brigade to actually even speak out against it. Last year, signs appeared on the toilet doors of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Did you see these? Advising that their commitment to inclusion and diversity meant that staff should feel free to use whichever bathroom best fit their, identity, their gender identity. So Scott Morrison, again, said this was, and I'll quote, over-the-top political correctness, and the signs were removed. So that's great. That's great for the PM's department, but what about our children's schools? In one way, I don't care what they do in the PM's department. They're big enough and ugly enough to choose whatever toilet they want. But leave our children's schools alone. Um, but the trans activists do not give up. They continue to launch gender-fluid bathrooms right across our state and, state and yours. But I'm going to say to you now, neither will we give up. They are not giving up, neither will we. Because we are parents... We are grandparents, we are teachers, we are sisters, we are brothers, and we care about truth and we care about justice. But can I encourage you today to be willing to stand for truth? And sometimes that's actually against incredible odds. We need to be bold. We must be counted amongst those who will stand up for the empirical reality of biological sex. We are called to stand for truth, even when that conflicts with popular sentiment and so-called compassion. Sadly today, under the banner of compassion, truth is being compromised and even being called hateful, which is the opposite of what God is, because God is love. But love and truth are never enemies. They are never in conflict. What is in conflict is truth and culture. But courage is essential. I've just looked out and seen Bob Day here. Can I just say hi, Bob? And... Um, Thank you for being here and thank you for what you taught me. Yeah.